What's cracking, everybody? Welcome back to Gaming 101 with Mr. Burger and the next installment of Burger Reviews. <laughs> Today, we're going to be taking a look at my most recent addiction, Black Desert Online. I don't want to waste your time. I want to get straight to the point. Overall, I give BDO four burgers out of five. So what is Black Desert Online? How would I describe it? And how would I describe its genre? Well, BDO is undeniably an MMORPG, but it kind of follows in the veins of the old school open world RPGs that you would find in games like Warcraft 3. There's so many options of things to do. There's so much and such a constant sense of progression that it's a little bit different from what I traditionally thought of as the MMO staple, which was something like World of Warcraft. Now let's get right into what I consider pretty much the most important part of a game, which is the gameplay. Overall, I actually give BDO a perfect five burgers out of five when it comes to gameplay. There is just so much to do. I honestly really enjoy a majority of it as well. I really like the gameplay of this so much. Now, this is gonna be a long one, so buckle up and use those timestamps if you wanna skip ahead. The first thing that I wanna talk about that you can do is questing. Now, questing is pretty straightforward. You can take a look at our quest log here. You've got like a main story quest. I've done a lot of it on this character. You got a bunch of suggested side quests for different rewards. There's recurring daily quests or weekly quests. You got a list of your ongoing quests. There's literally thousands and thousands of quests in this world. So there's, if you're the kind of person that likes questing, there's a never ending supply of those. So don't worry about that. Another thing that you can do, a major part of this game is grinding. So grinding, is a non-stop grind in this game, quite literally. When people are like, I'm looking for a game where I can grind a lot for a long time, hours and hours, days and days, everybody's always like, well, play BDO. It's a non-stop grind. You can do it at the end of the game, once you get geared to get even better gear or to farm money to get other things. You can do it early on to level up. There's so many different spots. You can always find a spot that's appropriate for you and your gear score and your level. So grinding is definitely like a super major part of this game. Another big part of this game is actually going to be leveling alts. Now if we take a quick look here, we can see that I've got a bunch of alts here. A bunch of different classes that I wanted to try. There's a lot of different classes that you can play. There's like, I don't know the exact number, but it's something like 20 classes now or something. And they add more like pretty consistently. They've added quite a few since release. So leveling alts is a really major part of this game. If you look at a game like WoW, right? Leveling alts was a big part of that. And a recent MMO like New World kind of missed the mark on that one. You kind of would just stick with one character. You could have an alt, but it would be on a completely different server. So there wasn't that replayability value there. BDO really encourages leveling alts. Now on top of all of this, as you level alts, you get more fame and your fame stacks up across your family. And I'm not going to go too in depth to that now, but basically you can see that there's certain thresholds that I reach and for a certain, uh, fame that I currently have right now I'm at 2828 combat fame when I reach 3000 I'll increase from 2,220,000 silver per day to 2,400,000 silver per day so as you level alts you get more combat fame you get more daily passive income and the money system in this game is really good which we'll talk about a little bit more there's also more active income up here we have energy Energy is used to do a lot of things in this game, like gathering, and I'll probably talk more about that later. But essentially, you raise your energy cap, and that raises it across all of your characters on your account. So, if you can only do, like, 100 energies worth of gathering, but you have 5 alts, now you can do five or 600 worth energy of gathering, right? So, the energy cap being shared across all your characters potentially gives you more active income depending on how you apply that energy and how you use it. There's also more opportunity for other things like contribution points uh, because you are completing more quests. Whenever you turn in a quest, you get a little bit of contribution points. Now that's kind of not as significant as something like the shared energy cap because there's better ways and more consistent ways to farm contribution points, but it's definitely there and it's a factor that comes into play when you're talking about leveling alts and the advantages of it. Here we are on Heidel, and I wanted to come here to talk about the next topic, which is actually going to be group content. Now, group content is not as relevant and consistent in this game as it is in certain other MMOs, but it is there. It is present. 
there's a good amount of options when it comes to group content. So one of the major things that you can do is, let's take a quick look at the map here. Now this is, if you're new to this game, it's just gonna be absolutely overwhelming and that's okay. I've got a lot of the map revealed, but if you're new to the game, you won't be seeing a lot of this. Now I am currently on an Elvia server. So if we take a look at one of these areas near town, it says recommended AP of 250. So AP is your attack power. So it's just a measurement of how strong your character is, kind of like a gear score. It also says party of three recommended. Whereas these places over here, see, they don't say anything about party of three. If we go further out, we can see there's a couple spots here in the desert that are lower AP, like this one's only 190 at the Basilisk Den, but it still requires a party of three or recommends a party of three. And the way that that works is essentially that the enemies are scaled to be able to take a lot more damage before they die, but they aren't necessarily going to kill you a lot quicker, right? So it's kind of designed to be taken down with a group. And on top of that, the way that the loot is split is a little bit different when you go to those group content spots and it becomes more consistent for all the players across the group. Whereas if you were trying to do that spot alone individually, it wouldn't necessarily be the same. It would be, you know, be getting a lot less money than you could make at like an individual person spot. But those spots are there. So we want to talk about that for sure. Now, another thing that you can do is you can actually uh, gather together. So one of the biggest things about this game, and I'll talk about guilds a little bit more later, but is uh, guilds and guild missions. So for example, I could pop this extra large gather deer meat mission, and then I could go down here near bear where all the deer are. There's a spot right here where there's a bunch of deer. And I could go there with one or two of my other guildies and we could all gather together. You kill the deer, you gather their blood for alchemy or you gather their meat for cooking. And at the same time, we could be getting more income because we're completing that guild mission together in the allotted time. So it's kind of a double whammy, kill two birds with one stone deal. Um, so yeah, gathering is absolutely applicable when it comes to group content. It's not super based around doing it as a group, but there is that option. I play this game a lot with my fiance and we do a lot of gathering together. That's one of our preferred activities actually. Another thing that you can do is sailing or sailies together. Sailing is a major part of this game, and I'm gonna talk about all the different, what we call life skills in just a moment here. But you can see there's this massive ocean. And if you get to a point where you can unlock the sailing dailies, or as we call them, sailies, then you can essentially just ride on somebody's boat, because it takes a long time to get a good boat. But if your buddy's got a real good boat, you just hop on his, he goes around, knocks out all the sailies for you, and you get them done, you get credit for it, and then you can turn them all in. And in the meantime, you can be like fishing on the side of his boat or just hanging out watching Netflix or something like that, right? So that is another option for group content is the sailing and the sailies. Lastly, there is PvP. I'm gonna be completely honest. I'm not gonna touch PvP too much in this video because although I am on big on PvP in other games, I just haven't really done it much, if at all, in this game, despite having played for a while now. But I know that there is a good amount of group PvP content. You can do node wars, there's guild wars, things like that. Uh, I've seen some pretty cool videos of some pretty big scale fights, and we will be talking to my buddy about some PvP content in the future here. So keep your ears appealed for that one. But just keep in mind when it comes to group content, there is a decent chunk of PvP group, group content available for you to play. Now, another gameplay aspect, if you're really into this, is you can actually work the market. I know that was a big thing in World of Warcraft and other MMOs where you kind of buy on the cheap, undercut people, and then you sell it when stuff is really expensive and you make a good profit by doing that. There is a slightly fixed economy in this game, so stuff is only worth so much on average, right? So for example, this Tet Monos Lumbering Axe, boy that's a mouthful, on average is 2.6 billion silver, but if we look at it, on the marketplace, let's find the Tet, 2.6 average, we can see that it could go for as cheap as 2.4 or as expensive as 2.7 or 2.8. We can also see that there's a fluctuation in pricing here. So certain things will go up and down. Now there's a pretty massive cut when it comes to taxes in this game. I believe it's something like 30%. It's pretty significant. So you can't necessarily buy stuff when it's cheap and then sell it for just a little bit more you've got to have a pretty big difference, or you can buy things when they're cheap and then do some sort of processing or cooking or crafting. And we'll talk about all this actually in pretty much one of our next topics here and then sell it for more because the processed or cooked or crafted version is worth significantly more. The next thing that I would like to talk about is exploring and knowledge. This is a pretty big major content 
aspect of this game. As you can see here, we've got a pretty massive map. I mean, just look at this thing. Now, a lot of it is unfinished. This whole fogged-in area down here, there's nothing there. You can't go there yet. It's probably there, but it's like walled off by an invisible wall. I've, for the most part, explored everything. So you can see it's a pretty massive map, right? You got this whole desert area over here. Can't get up there yet. And then, of course, you got the massive ocean. There isn't a whole lot in here, but it is there. You can go there, and it's it's present. And then there's a tiny little port rat up there. You can get up there. There's almost nothing there, but it's kind of cool to do, um, especially if you like doing, you know, bartering or trading and stuff like that. And, you know, there's this whole region down here. So it's massive. It's a pretty massive map. And I've had the opportunity to explore most of that. And in exploring, I have raised my knowledge. So if you press H, that's the default key, you open up this whole new massive menu. And one of the topics in this menu, uh, if you go to character, there's a whole drop down menu, and then say like people of Serendia, and then like upper class of Heidel, because we're in Heidel now. You basically go and talk to all these different NPCs, and then you'll get knowledge in that category. And once you complete a category or get X amount of knowledge points in a category, you raise your energy cap. And we have talked about energy a little bit, and I will be talking about it a little bit more here in just a moment when we talk about gathering. But just know that raising your energy cap is a really good thing. It's something that you want to do because it's used for a lot of things. So in exploring, in looking at all these places and exploring to all these cool towns, maybe you're like, oh, I want to try venturing into the desert and see what happens, and you end up at, you know, Sand Grain Bazaar, right? Like, go around and talk to all the NPCs at Sand Grain Bazaar or whatever town you end up in. Because in doing so, you're going to be raising your knowledge and in turn, raising your energy cap, which is something that you definitely, absolutely want. The next major gameplay aspect that I want to talk about for BDO is life skilling. Now, this is a pretty lengthy one, so go ahead and use the timestamps below if you don't want to hear too much about life skilling, because there's a lot for me to cover here. As you can see at our list here, there's a whole lot of different life skills that we have to cover. In fact, let's go take a look at my nice little house that I have over here in Heidel. By the way, Heidel 9-4 is probably the biggest and best residence in Heidel, which is one of the most popular cities for sure, because of its central location. And we'll get a little further up here as we take a look at these life skills. This is kind of the decoration zone. I put all my nice fancy furniture here. And downstairs, as you may have seen, we've got some tools. And the reason I'm bringing us to my house here is because we need to use these tools in order to do some of these life skills. So, as you can see, we have a whole huge list of life skills here. Let me move this up so my camera's not covering it. We have gathering, fishing, hunting, cooking, alchemy, processing, training, trading, farming, sailing, and bartering. Now some of these kind of go hand in hand and are related to each other. So I've kind of separated them into a list that makes sense to me based on which ones are kind of related to each other. So I'm not necessarily going to cover them in this order. But that being said, let's get right to it. First of all, you have gathering. Gathering is kind of complex in the way that there's a lot of different ways to do it. If we take a look at this life skill tree here, we can see within gathering, I have masteries in all of these different skills. In fact, let's put my gathering clothes on and the mastery jumps right up. And if we put, say, my monos, Tet Monos Butcher Knife on, my butchering mastery jumps up even more. So as you can see, gathering is broken down into all these different things. Lumbering, fluid collecting, hoe gathering, butchering, tanning, mining, water scooping. And each of those you can level up through mastery in its own way, through your gear and through leveling up gathering. But that being said, they're all tied together. So for example, my gathering master, my gathering level, excuse me, is master six. And it goes through progression of like, you know, beginner and then... Um, skilled and apprentice or apprentice and then skilled and then you go through you know like what is it professional and artisan and master and then guru did i get that all right guys you can correct me in the comments if i was wrong anyway as you level up those skills in respective life skills your mastery naturally goes up so i have 430 mastery from just my gathering skill being master level six on this character all that extra mastery comes from the gear that i equipped because i've got this really good a gathering gear and this really good gathering knife right now if i put on say my trainer's clothes and my riding crop my training mastery now jumps up but all my gathering mastery jumps down so there's this sense of progression through all these life skills through leveling up your mastery that you can get through first of all leveling up the life skill itself and second of all getting better gear some gear applies to all life skills like your accessories some gear applies only to specific life skills like say your trainer's clothes versus your gatherer's clothes and all this is relevant to all these life skills that we're going to talk about. But gathering is kind of the most 
first and foremost and important one, so to speak. When you think of life skills, I think back, and I'll probably refer to this a lot, to WoW, to World of Warcraft, when you had things like professions, is what we call them there. These are basically BDO's version of professions. It's a little bit different because in WoW, you could only take two. And you would generally do something like mining, which would go with engineering or jewel crafting or blacksmithing, right? And you would pair those two together. In this game, it's a little bit different because you can do each and every one of them and they're broken down in the way that like gathering covers all of those things. Gathering covers, like in WoW, it was mining, skinning, herbalism, right? Gathering flowers and stuff. You can do all those with your gathering stat. It's all tied together. But there's a lot of different other professions that you can look at too. Gathering is like the most straightforward, basic one. You know what I mean? Like you get an axe and you go start chopping trees, right? You get a pickaxe and you go start mining ore and getting some silver and gold and gems and stuff like that. Then you take it and you turn it into other things or you just straight up sell it. Now let's move on to some of these other life skills since I've kind of given us a basic rundown of life skills and related to gathering because gathering is kind of the most important one. The next one that I want to talk about is processing. Now processing goes kind of hand in hand with gathering. As you can see, we've got like processing gear. We've even got these processing stones, which will increase our processing mastery. And processing, if we open it up here, we can see there's a whole bunch of different kinds of processing. You know, you've got shaking, grinding, chopping, drying, filtering, heating, repairing, simple alchemy, simple cooking. Then you've got some imperial stuff, some manufacturing, all kinds of stuff like that. And all of that, again, is tied into your processing mastery, which is based on your processing level as well as the gear that you have equipped currently. And those are also broken down into different things. So for example, if I were to equip my Tetlogia Processing Stone Energy, geez, some of these names are a mouthful, huh? My chopping goes way up, right? My chopping jumped up like 100, 200, sorry. So there's processing, and essentially what you're doing is you're taking stuff that you've gathered or that you've bought, and you're changing it into something else. So for example, I could take some water and I could filter it into purified filtered water. I could take some milk, I could process it into you know cheese, and I could sell that. There's a lot of different things that you can do like that. One of my favorite is actually chopping. So I'll get a bunch of wood and I'll just chop a bunch of wood for a long time and you can make planks and you can make money off of that or you can use it to build a boat. So processing is a pretty good activity when it comes to money making. It's decent, but it is a little bit more AFK oriented. And this game has a huge AFK system that I will talk about in depth a little bit later. But let's focus on the life skills here now. Just know that processing is a little bit more passive and it's not a very active life skill. Whereas gathering generally is a little bit more active. The next one that I want to talk about is cooking and alchemy. Cooking and alchemy, we're going to take a look down here because in order to do cooking and alchemy, you actually have to have these cooking tools or utensils, which is basically a stove, right? It's just because the game is translated, they called it a utensil. Or in this case, you got you know your alchemy utensil. Oh, I guess these ones are called tools. That's why I got mixed up. Anyway, what you do is you take all this stuff, you come here, and you've got a bunch of recipes, right? So for example, I do a lot of cooking vinegar. I've got some pre-selected recipes. I need like one potato, one sugar, one leavening agent, and one strawberry. And then you just sit there, you put all that in there, you start cooking or hit batch production to do a bunch. And then your character just sits there and cooks for a long time. And you can even put a little storage container right here so you can access the bank and get all your materials from your bank out of here directly in your house. And then you can cook right away. So when it comes to cooking an alchemy, they're similar because you have to buy a tool, you've got to gather all the materials or buy all the materials. Some can be bought on the marketplace, some can be gathered, some can be bought from vendors in town. And then you got to go buy a house, go into your house, place the tools, and then basically AFK cook or AFK make alchemy. And if we look at the town here, you can see there's a bunch of different places that we can buy. And essentially you can turn any of these into a residence, but not necessarily into something else. They've all got certain things that they can all be turned into but you can always turn every single one into a storage and residence. So you find one that you really like, you make that your house, and then you put your tools in there, and then you cook or do alchemy for hours on end, or to your heart's content, or however you please, right? All right, so then I, the next one that I would like to talk about is training. Training has recently become one of my more favorite ones. In fact, I have all my training gear on right now. And if we go out here, we can get on my horse. We'll give him a little jump here. He'll take a little damage, that's okay. He's a tough guy. And how you do training is you train and you capture and you breed horses. So essentially, you set a looped path like this, 
and you just AFK run your horse for literally hours on end. There is an issue with training because you tend to sometimes get off path if you leave it for too long. Um, and there's other things that can go wrong, and you can only do it within a town, or people can kill you while you're AFK. So, if you can check on it every once in a while, it's good, but sometimes you get lucky, you can run it for hours on end. But if you want to do it more actively, you go and you capture horses. And you get this lasso thing, you get this rope, and this sugar, and you go and capture a horse, actually. And then you can breed them, there's a whole breeding system that we can do. And you can make more horses, and you can sell the horses. And it's, it's a pretty cool one. I like it a lot. But the actual training of the horses to level them up, you have to AFK run them for a long time. So that's why you'll see people in town doing like that. What that guy's doing right there, right? Just running back and forth. He's training a horse. That guy with his wagon, I can almost guarantee you that they're doing the same thing. Training their horses. You can see here that we got a few different horses. Uh, there's breed options for them. If they're breedable, they'll have like a number. Uh, this one is breedable, so it's got a number one for breedable. And after I breed it, it won't be able to breed again. That's how the system works in this game. So basically, you capture a horse, you AFK train it to, you know, 15 or 30, and then you can breed it if you want to, and then you can sell the horse or trade it in or something like that. So it's another life skill option. It's a lot of fun, but it's not super active unless you're actively capturing horses. But hey, it's there. Now, I almost forgot to mention the life skill of trading. But trading is not super relevant right now. Basically, you have your workers in this village take wood that you gather, or you have them gather, and you have them put them into crates, and then you ship the crates from one side of the map, like, say, Grana, all the way to the other side of the map at Valencia, and you sell it all, and suddenly your trading experience goes way up, and you can make some profit once you sell it all. But it's not very profitable. It's done over a long period of time, you can do it a little bit more actively by buying trade goods at one town and bringing them in a wagon or a horse or on your back to another town and selling them. But the time invested for the amount of money that you make is very, very bad. So it's not the best life skill currently, but it is there and it is something that you can do if you're interested in it. All right, next thing that I would like to talk about is fishing. So for fishing, we can actually go back down here and take a look at what I was doing earlier. Fishing's interesting because it's primarily AFK when you think of BDO, if you've heard of this game, you might have heard of people AFK fishing. In fact, look at all these people here in town, AFK fishing, right? So basically you just sit here, you put on your fishing gear, and then you just sit here and you can fish for literally hours. You can leave your computer running overnight. You can leave it running while you're at work. You can put the game into the tray, which is a really nice option that they have for this game. And you can AFK fish for a really long time. Alternatively, you can actually take your boat out and you can go to hot spots. You take your boat out into the sea, pretty much anywhere. Not actually out into the ocean, but in the islandy area. And you'll see a bunch of fish kind of jumping on the water and a bunch of seagulls hovering above them. And then you can capture those fish. And the more that you level up your fishing, the more likely you are to see different hot spots. If we look at this one right here, level up to discover flocks of seagulls more frequently. So as you level up your fishing, you'll see those hot spots more often. When you go to a hot spot, you'll get better fish. It's not the most lucrative life skill, but it's there. It's really easy to do when you're AFK, and it's very popular. Moving right along, next we have sailing and bartering. Now, I want to actually... Oh, let's catch a fish, and what do you know? It's a key. I want to actually head on over to my boat for that one. So if we put our gear back on here... Now, if we talk about sailing and bartering, those two kind of go hand in hand because in order to barter, you have to sail. You cannot barter without sailing. The sailing system is pretty cool. You start with a basic boat and you do sailies a lot to level up your sailing skill. And as you level up your sailing skill, you get more skills on your boat. And as you level up your sailing mastery, your acceleration, your speed, your turn, and your brake on your boat get better as well. And the sailies are interesting because they you kind of go around shooting sea monsters, things like that with your cannons. But there's also bartering, and some of the sailies involve bartering. And bartering is basically what you would expect. You start with a basic material, you bring it to one island, you trade it for something a little bit better. In fact, we're going to do a barter refresh right now, and I'll give you an example of that. So for example, we would start with, say, normal to level 1 good, right? We'd bring like 200 spirits leaf and get 
up to six naval rations. And then we take the level one naval rations. And we could exchange at least two of them each for three sea survival kits. And then we take the sea survival kits and exchange those for pirate supply box. And so on and so forth until you get to the level five materials. And the level five materials you can then sell or you can trade in for crow coins, which are another currency which this game has no shortage of that allows you to further progress your sailing and your bartering. It allows you to get things that upgrade your boat and things like that. Now we're not actually gonna make it to my boat in time, but we'll take a quick look at it while we're talking about the next few, which is going to be hunting and lastly, farming. Hunting I only got into recently and I actually really enjoy it. It's pretty cool. You get this gun, you get this matchlock and you go out and you hunt specific animals and suddenly this game becomes like a third person shooter. And it changes your mobility, you, it, you kind of slow down and you use more stamina to sprint and you can do rolls and you get like a special dash attack and you right click to reload, which is kind of awkward at first. And basically you hunt animals and then you go and skin them or butcher them once they're dead and you get the meat or the blood or whatever it might be in order to sell that, level up your hunting and make some profit from the stuff that you sell. So really quickly, we'll take out the boat here. Uh, let's take a quick little sail here to one of the islands to give you guys an example of that. I do enjoy the hunting. It's similar to gathering because you hunt the animals and then you basically gather them. You basically butcher them or skin them in the same way that you might do if you were gathering otherwise. Now, lastly, let's talk about farming. Unfortunately, I can't talk too much about farming because I actually have not done this. I've literally done every other life skill in this game except for farming so i don't have much to say about that but essentially you have to have a lot of contribution points which i'm currently don't have a lot of and you invest these contribution points into like plots or fences and then you can farm stuff you can grow vegetables and things which you can use for your cooking which you can use for selling right off to the market immediately and making some profit and that's pretty much it so I don't know too much about that, but those are the basics when it comes to farming. And those are all of the life skills. So thank you for listening to my explanation of all those. Lastly, when it comes to gameplay, the last thing that I want to talk about is actually the enhancing system. Oof. The enhancing system is just a whole thing. And a lot of people quit this game because of the enhancing system. When you enhance something, you have a chance for your gear to, depending on what it is, be downgraded or for it to be completely destroyed. And when we talk about enhancing, this is the way that we progress our gear, that we get better gear. Now you can buy a lot of better gear directly off the market and be completely fine with that. But that gear has to come from being enhanced at one point anyway. And it's basically a gamble. You have a chance to succeed or you have a chance to fail. And if you fail, you can lose a lot of money. So the enhancing system tends to be one of those things that drives people away from this game a lot. Some people absolutely love it and you can make a lot of money from it, but you can also lose a lot. So for example, the other day, I bought this basilisk belt at Try for, you know, about a billion silver. And I was going to try to enhance it up to Tet, which is level 4. And I would have made about 3 billion silver profit. But instead, I wasted a bunch of materials, failed it 3 times, and it fell down to Duo. Which now it's only worth 304 million. So I actually ended up losing a bunch of money. Now I'm not somebody that usually enhances. I'm definitely not a gambling man. But if you know yourself to have a gambling problem, where you know you don't like gambling mechanics, this is one of the major complaints that I have about this game is the enhancing system because it straight up is like a casino and it's one of the main things that causes people to leave this game. So there are safer ways to do it. They've introduced seasons where enhancing is a lot safer and you can get your basic gear up to a certain point. But honestly, if you want to try to progress pretty much any of the end game gear, unless you're willing to just like straight up buy it and farm silver forever to buy it, you have to enhance at some point. It's a pretty big part of the game and it's definitely not my favorite part of the game so those are all the aspects of gameplay let's go ahead and move on into the next topic now despite my issues with enhancing overall i really enjoy the gameplay which is why i gave the game a perfect five burgers out of five when it came to gameplay 
Now the next topic that I would like to talk about is the learning curve. Ooh boy, look at this UI. Can you guys see this? How many buttons are there? How many stats are there? How many buffs are there? Look at this crazy map. Why is there so many arrows? Why is there so many quests? Why is there more buttons down here? Why is there my skills? What are all these cannons? What are all these numbers? I'm losing it. At least that's how I felt when I first started the game. There is an absolutely massive learning curve in this game. And I will talk more about the UI, but that's a major reason for it. Overall, I give BDO's learning curve a mere two burgers out of five. I got discouraged a few times when I first started this game because there's a lot to learn. And honestly, I put it down for a couple weeks. Um, I started playing the New World beta went around when I started this game, actually, as well as Swords of Legends Online. But when the New World beta ended, I kind of had this MMO withdrawal. So I was like, oh, I want to play some good MMO. And Swords of Legends just wasn't quite cutting it for me. It just If you guys have heard of that game, it didn't do too well here in the Western United States um, with the Western audience. It's traditionally a Chinese MMO that they brought over here to the West, and it just wasn't quite as successful. But hey, neither was the big Western game, at least made here by Amazon, uh, which was New World. So I ended up playing BDO mostly because, well, we've just finished talking about the life skills, right? I really enjoyed the gathering. I was like, oh, I, I kind of like this. Like, I can go around and gather trees, and there's this nice sense of progression. So that was pretty cool. Um, I really liked that. And I ended up putting massive amounts of time into it. When New World launched, I did try to play it for a while, but I was starting to get really into BDO. So I, as you guys probably know, New World kind of flopped and I was focused more on this and this game has had a more consistent player base. So I ended up sticking with BDO because of that. But as you can see, the UI is pretty massive. Uh, here's the skill screen. There's a lot of skills and at least the first time that I looked at this, it didn't look very clear to me it looked kind of like a mess. There's so much going on, what goes where, what, what do these little dots represent? Finally, I figured that all out and everything honestly does have its place. And at this point, now that I know the game better, I could look at pretty much anything on this screen and tell you what it is, what it is and what it's for and why it's there, right? But starting off, definitely not. That was pretty difficult for me to get over when it came to the learning curve. Now, to be fair, there's some really good YouTubers from the West that have kind of explained everything and broken it down in language that we might be able to understand a little bit better because this game is traditionally Korean. So a lot of the information comes from Korea and sometimes certain things are lost in translations. Uh, so we do have a pretty good sort of backup when it comes to being able to get the resources that we need to figure things out. But a major thing that I would recommend is finding a good guild. When I joined this guild Solstice, wow, it made a major difference for me. And they've you know, been so kind to promote me to an officer and everything at this point. But that's what helped me get over that big initial learning curve. I promise you, if you can stick it out, this game is worth it. It's a really awesome game. Allow yourself time to be a noob at it and get over that learning curve. And it's a lot of fun after that. So unfortunately, I can give the learning curve in BDO only a mere two burgers out of five. Now moving on to the next topic that I want to talk about, let's talk about the difficulty of this game. I actually give the implementation of the difficulty in this game a solid four burgers out of five. Once you get past that initial massive hump of a learning curve, the game itself is not that difficult per se, but the difficulty is actually implemented very well. You know what you're getting yourself into with this game, right? It's this massive grinder game. If you're doing fighting and it's too hard, you just need to go to an easier area until you get better gear. Think of a game like Diablo 3. If you've ever played Diablo 3, you know that the difficulty is relative to your gear and the current difficulty settings of the game that you're in. Let's say you're playing on Torment 10 in Diablo 3. You can't quite hack it. You turn it down to 9. Nine's too hard. You turn it down to Torment 7. Seven's too easy. You can handle more. So you're like, ah, Torment 8 is that sweet spot. And that's what you grind for a while, right? Until you get better gear. And then you could turn up the difficulty to 9 and then 10 and then 11 and then 12, right? And keep going higher as you get stronger. So it's similar in this game. You start off, you've got some low level spots. Let's see, over here we've got like a level 27 to 31, a 32 to 34, a 30 to 32, a 39 to 42, so on and so forth. 
And then once you get to the end game, it's based on your AP or your attack power. So over here in Camasilvia, we've got like a 240, a 120 to 190, a 300. That's a really late game place. A 260. One of the most popular places to grind is out here, Polly's Forest. And that's a 160. So let's say that you're like, oh, I can't quite handle one of these places. You just go somewhere a little bit easier, right? If you can't quite handle, say, this uh, 210 zone or this 240 zone, maybe, you know, try the 120 to 190 zone, right? If you can't do Star's End yet because it's 260, you know, go somewhere a little bit easier. Go all the way over to the other side of the map <laughs> where the desert is and go grind at Sulfur Mines or something, right? Make a bunch of money doing that. So difficulty relative to your gear level, relative to where you're grinding, and that's implemented very well. But all of this is in terms of PvE grinding content, right? There's a whole plethora of alternative gameplay loops. I talked forever about life skills, and I spend most of my time doing that. So I'm not like, oh, this the spot's too hard for me to grind, because most of the time I'm not grinding, right? I'm usually out there sailing or gathering or processing or cooking or something like that, right? So those things aren't necessarily difficult. So I wouldn't rate the difficulty level of it because it's just it's just a matter of like going around and collecting things or like selecting the right materials to cook, right? It's not like, oh, this is a really hard boss for me to fight or anything like that. No, the life skilling system is a little bit more laid back and chill, which is why I focus more on the PvE content when it comes to difficulty. So overall, I give BDO's difficulty and the implementation of its difficulty a solid four burgers out of five. The next topic that I'd like to cover is the replayability value of this game. I give BDO's replayability a perfect five burgers out of five. <laughs> And the replay value of this game is absolutely insane. I'm currently at about 3,000 hours <laughs> and counting. I don't see myself stopping anytime soon. I've met people that have over 40,000 hours in this game. You heard me right, on Steam, since it launched on Steam, 40,000 hours. Now, play times are definitely inflated by the AFK system. As I mentioned, a lot of this stuff can be done AFK. Let's try not to get killed here, jump over these guys fighting. And we're going to go more in depth about this AFK system in a little while here but just know that like if i'm leaving my game running afk fishing while i'm at work all day that's like eight hours or whatever of me not actually playing the game but steam counting those hours so those play times are inflated but i'm not gonna lie i've still put a huge amount of time into this game i really like it a lot there's so much that you can do the replay value is absolutely insane now let's go ahead and move on to the next topic, but just keep in mind overall, for me, BDO gets a perfect five burgers out of five when it comes to replayability and replay value. The next topic that I would like to cover in BDO is the visuals. Visuals actually get a perfect five burgers out of five from me. Now BDO is a very visually pleasing game. It is very, you know, kind of anime, quote unquote, which I normally don't like, but it's starting to kind of grow on me a bit here. Um, and they do a really good job of it here, of making it not look too, you know, how do I say this, anime style, not making it too look too much like a cartoon, but at the same time, still kind of staying true to that style of art and that genre and everything. So it kind of got my attention. I had my settings on the specific setting. If we go here, while well, we're getting to this prettier area, and you go to performance settings and you go to graphics and textures, you can set it to high end graphics and you can set it to remastered. And it actually looks really good. I really liked it. But one of my guildies pointed out to me that you can actually turn that off and change it down to the like very high end settings because it was causing certain issues that were kind of off putting to me. Yeah, it looked really nice. But first of all, it caused my frames to drop a bit, which is always annoying, especially when you're trying to fight stuff, right? Second of all, it made everything look kind of like shiny and wet. Like, I don't know if that's the right way to describe it, but like even if you weren't getting rained on at the moment, everything just looked kind of shiny and it was kind of weird. Also, the bloom was absolutely overkill. Now, a lot of this stuff got solved when I changed the graphics down, right? I hit escape, I went to settings, performance settings, graphics and textures, and I turned off the remastered and just set it to very high. And it got way better for sure, but that was when it comes to those issues that I had and the performance issues. The game looked better. It looked really nice in the remastered setting. So if your computer can handle that and you don't mind like that bloom overkill, by the way, bloom is like when you step out of a building that's dark and you're out in the sun and all of a sudden everything's like super bright for the first two seconds while your eyes catch up. It was like a visual effect that they try to add in these games to 
mimic what we see with our eyes. It was just way too much. If you don't mind that though, the remastered settings look really good. Very, very visually pleasing. You've also got a whole lot of different cool um, outfits and stuff like that. So let's take a little, uh, a little stop here. We can look at my character here. See, she's kind of got a nice little outfit. She's got a kitty thing going on with her kitty whiskers and the um, the crown thing going on. It was a thing that this specific class had. She's got another outfit. If we go here to the pearl shop and we go to apparel and we go to outfits, these are things you can buy with real money and this is how they make a lot of their money. Um, this was one that I really liked. I thought that was really cool looking. Maybe I'd take out the kitty whiskers for that one, right? But you can see there's a lot of really... There's a lot of other really cool ones. Um, this one I actually have. They handed that one out for free. That one's actually pretty nice. So fashion, fashion endgame is seriously like a major part of this. And if you look at my other characters, like look at this dude, man. He's got a pretty cool look. In fact, let's change to him real quick, right? It's a pretty big part of this. It's a pretty major part of the game. And a lot of people at the end game come up with all different kinds of cool outfits and different dyes and things like that, that they can do for their character to make them look really awesome. And that adds to the visuals for me a lot. Now, all that being said, as you noticed, and this is kind of, I gotta put this as a, as a forewarning and a fair warning in my reviews, because on my channel, if you've been following me for a while, you know that I, I'm a little bit more, you know, family friendly and, and PG or PG-13 oriented, but you probably noticed that some of these outfits are kind of like hypersexualized, and that needs to be said. It is a 16 plus game rated, I believe. Uh, so if you are under the age that's appropriate for this, this might not be the game for you. A lot of the female outfits are a lot more scantily clad than they need to be. Look at my male character here. He, uh, he you know, he's got all this really cool armor, right? To be fair. He does have some other outfits, you know, that are a little bit more showy, right? But he looks more like a Spartan warrior. Uh, when it comes to the female outfits, there's definitely this aspect of something that we see in games a lot, which is kind of the over and hypersexualization, particularly of female characters. So I want to put that forewarning out there. Make sure that if you're under the age, it's appropriate for the, this game. You talk to your parents about it, right? Be sure that it's okay with them that you're playing this game. Um, and make that decision, let them make that decision, or if you're of age, just be conscious of it. If that's something that bothers you, this might not be the game for you, right? But if it doesn't bother you, for a lot of people, it's it's a plus factor. So, all that being said, it is there, and I really enjoy the overall visuals of this game, which is why I give BDO a perfect five burgers out of five when it comes to visuals. The next topic that I would like to cover is BDO's UI, or user interface. If I'm being honest, at least when you start this game, the UI is an absolute nightmare, which is why I give BDO's UI a mere two burgers out of five. As I was talking about earlier, there is so much stuff on this screen, like what are all these buttons? You really need to be patient with it because everything honestly does have a place and its own usage. And most of the time it does have some sort of reasoning that makes sense but not always, right? Sometimes it's just some sort of weird coding thing that they did or they made an adjustment to make it work with something else. So it's a pretty overwhelming UI. Um, keep in mind that this is originally a Korean made game. So after I was talking with my brother who works in the gaming industry, he explained to me that he's noticed a certain pattern in like the Eastern MMOs versus the Western MMOs. This kind of overwhelming interface, you know, having a lot of pets, a few other aspects, these are really present and popular and preferred by some Eastern cultures, such as Korea or China. Uh, taking a look at more Western MMOs, like take a look at something that was recently released, like say New World, right? We can see that a lot of these systems are minimal or they're not present. The UI was, stuff was bigger. It was more, New World's not the best example because it wasn't very streamlined to be honest, but you get the idea. The UI looks very different and there wasn't as much excessive stuff on it, right? Even with a game like WoW, yes, with all the add-ons, you can have a pretty massive UI, but the vanilla basic UI isn't as complex as a game like this, like Black Desert Online. So learning the UI can be really difficult and it's a major part of the learning curve. But once you get it, like I said, everything does have its place. I think it could be done a lot better. I think that it's kind of messy and that's just my personal opinion. 
and because of that massive learning curve and getting used to everything, I could only give BDO's UI a mere two burgers out of five. Moving right along, the next topic that I would like to cover is BDO's controls. I'm giving BDO's controls a kind of middle ground three burgers out of five. I'm giving it a kind of somewhat middle ground rating because they do feel kind of awkward and unusual at first. A lot of the controls will feel familiar if you are a PC gamer. You got W, A, S, D to move, space to jump, right? You move your mouse around to change the direction you're in. You tap shift or hold shift to sprint. A lot of that is going to feel very familiar for sure, right? Even more so, you got like, you got I for inventory, right? Things like that. So that is pretty good. I enjoy that, but it feels a little bit clunky at time. The combat controls to me at first felt a little bit clunky. Originally, I thought it was because it was a console game that was ported to PC. Like, that's kind of how it felt. But it turns out that it's not. <laughs> I was mistaken about that. You get some awkward, like, movement when it comes to certain hotkeys that I'm not used to. So, for example, to hold, to do this attack, I've got to hold S, which is the back hotkey. And to do this one, I've got to hold S and then tap left click for this one. Or right click for the dash, which is now on cooldown. And holding S just feels kind of awkward at least at first and then different classes have different hotkeys so it's not consistent it's not always like oh you're gonna use e or shift e to do something right this character does but your other character might use shift f to do something right that's my shift f this is my f now she has a down f she has a forward f but my other character might not have that right the hotkeys aren't necessarily consistent. You, They generally involve left click, right click, Q, E, F, sometimes things like Z, X, or C, or shift versions of all of those. But certain classes tend to use like their shift attacks a lot more. Uh, this one, I only really do this one for the shift attack, but on my Sage, that big red guy we that we were looking at earlier, I use shift attacks all the time. So all of a sudden, my left pinky is starting to hurt because I'm holding shift all the time. There are quick slot hotkeys, but they're limited from one to zero. There's no like, you know, shift one, shift two or anything like that. And you, because everything else is taken, like pretty much every single key on your keyboard does something. It's hard to sacrifice something to give it like a combat key. Um, so, you know, it's hard to change, like say your nine or your zero to like F because F is already, you know, one of my attacks by default. So the quick slot keys are limited in that regard. And on top of all of that, not every skill can be bound to a quick slot. Certain skills cannot be bound to a quick slot and that can cause some problems. So you can't really rely on that to solve your issues. And a lot of people say, you know, you don't necessarily want to rely on quick slots anyway. You want to get used to hitting the actual keys because every ability and every attack in this game, not every, but almost everyone pretty much has like a default hotkey that you hit or hotkeys that you hit in order to make it happen. Now, my fiance has a lot of trouble with the controls. I don't have a major issue with it but somebody that's coming from somebody who's like a major gamer who's been gaming for like his whole life and everything consistently so for somebody who isn't as serious about gaming as i am it's something to take into account she had a lot of issues with the controls the swimming is an absolute nightmare i will give you that even from me the swimming controls are just terrible and like the jumping and climbing over things can be a little bit difficult for her as well so that's something to take into account, take into your mind as you think about the controls. Overall though, I think it was pretty decent, which is why I give the controls of BDO a middle ground, hmm, three burgers out of five. Now for this next part, you might have noticed that the game audio is a lot louder, and that's because I want to talk about BDO's audio. We visited my nice little place here in Trent for reason. I really enjoy the music here. Overall, I give BDO's audio a solid four burgers out of five. I really enjoy the music in this game a lot in a lot of different areas. This is one of my favorite towns. I do a lot of gathering here. I hang out here a lot. And so I end up listening to the music here a lot. That being said, I do recall some kind of generic speed metal for some of the lower level grinding zones, which did kind of feel a little bit out of place on the medieval fantasy setting in this game. Um, I probably would have given the music itself a 5 out of 5, but overall the audio isn't perfect due to the voice acting lacking on some of the NPCs, among other small little nitpicks that I have. That being said, some of the voice acting is really good, like this lady here. 
Your horse looks tired. Hand the reins to me. I like her a lot. She's funny. She's like, your horse looks tired. Hand the reins to me, right? And then um, you've got, of course, the uh, fiery redhead over here who is like the total badass of this village and she chops all the lumber. The best timber is in Trent. Any objections? And then she tells us the best timber comes from Trent and she doesn't want to hear any objections. So I actually really enjoy the audio in this game overall, but it's not absolutely perfect, which is why I gave it four burgers out of five. In the vein of visuals and audio, the next topic that I would like to cover is BDO's overall atmosphere. I give BDO's atmosphere a perfect five burgers out of five. I really enjoy the overall atmosphere of this game. The visuals and audio blend together extremely well. When you're out in the desert, you can feel the heat. When you're in the, out in the ocean, you can feel the Calm Lagoon vibes. Here when you're in Trent, I feel like I'm in the middle of a giant lumberjacking camp. It's really awesome. It's done really well. It's very immersive. I really enjoy the atmosphere of this game a lot, which is why I'm giving it a perfect five burgers out of five. Now I wanna move next into some more title and genre specific categories. So these are topics or categories that wouldn't necessarily apply to every game or every genre, but I cherry pick the ones that I like that apply to this game and to the MMORPG genre. The first thing that I would like to talk about is the storyline. Now. Who is this little guy? He's the black spirit, and he's a big part of the storyline. To be honest, I'm not sure what to give the storyline. I've heard the story is pretty decent, but I've hardly invested into it at all. Most of what I do in the game is life skilling and leveling, so I tend to just spam R, as they say, right, and zoom through the story. This is common among a lot of players, at least those that I've discussed it with. Not a lot of people have actually played through the story and understand all the storyline and understand the lore, but it is there. And if we look at our main quest here, there is a whole main story quest. I've got a lot of it done already, but if you're on a newer character, there's a lot for you to do. Quite honestly, I want to let you know that the storyline is there, that it, it is present, but I don't know enough about it to give it an honest rating at the moment, which is why I would give it maybe a, I don't know, question mark burgers out of five. The next topic that I'd like to cover for BDO is BDO's combat system. I give BDO's combat system a middle ground, four burgers out of five. The combat system in BDO is a bit different than other MMOs, at least the ones that I've played. Um, I have little to no PvP experience in the game, so as I mentioned, I can't really talk too much about that. But as far as PvE goes, it's a lot of big group holes that you can generally mow down in a matter of like seconds, as you can see I'm doing here. Uh, if it takes you much longer, you generally just find like an easier area to grind in. Now, this isn't always the case because certain areas are known to have like mechanics that take them longer, or as I mentioned, there are certain grind spots that are meant to be done with more than one person. So you need to take that into account. But generally, if you're taking more than a few seconds to kill a pack, unless you're doing some really end game spots, then you probably want to find somewhere easier that's a little bit more relevant to your current AP. Pretty much every class in this game has a plethora of AoE abilities that allow, that allow you to pretty much just like tear through any group of mobs no matter what. Um, most of the late game spots, as you can see here, this being kind of one of the semi pseudo late game middle game spots, they've got big clumps, big groups of enemies, lots of packs and plentiful packs. There's absolutely, as I mentioned, some late game content wherein enemies have higher health pools and take longer or have, you know, mechanics that make them a little bit more difficult. So you need to take that into account as well. That is there. But for the most part, the things that I mentioned about, you know, it only taking a few seconds and it being big pack pulls are going to apply. Overall, I really do enjoy the combat in BDO. It is very grindy. It does get very repetitive. But it is pretty fun, and there's a lot of classes for you to try, which is why I give it a middle ground, pretty solid, four burgers out of five. Now for the next topic, I had to make a whole new category just for this game specifically, and that is the AFK system. I give BDO's AFK system a perfect five burgers out of five. Oh my goodness, absolute chef's kiss, I love it. The AFK system in this game is amazing. It's very innovative, it's very well done. I don't know if this is like a typical feature of Korean MMOs or Eastern MMOs, but this was my first time experiencing an encouraged AFK grinding system in a game. 
Now, I don't mean grinding in the sense of this game of like grinding enemy mobs. I mean like you can grind something in a game and do it for a long time and progress in it, right? Do it over and over and over. Like I mentioned earlier, you can literally leave your character here for hours if you have good gear and good mastery, not exaggerating, days on end without ever having to like go and check on them and clear out their inventory or anything like that. And they can be leveling up their fishing the whole time. So there's no need for bots in this game because the game basically has botting built into it. Now don't get me wrong, scripting is highly discouraged, in fact it's against the terms of service, and I know that they're actually pretty good about banning people that do use scripts, so I would not use any scripts or auto clickers or auto hotkeys or anything among the lines of that for this game. But the reason I'm mentioning this is because you don't really need to do that. There's so many activities that you can do AFK. Oh man, like I mentioned, you got fishing here. You can gather AFK because you can gather water and water bottles. And if you have enough energy, you can leave your character there for a long time doing that. Hunting, I don't think you can do. Cooking is heavily AFK. Alchemy is heavily AFK. Processing is heavily AFK. Training, heavily AFK. Trading, uh, it is partially AFK because you have to run from one area to another for a long time. It takes a long time. Farming can be done partly AFK, sailing and bartering also semi-AFK or partly AFK. So there's a very good AFK system in this game. It's highly encouraged, I really enjoy it, which is why I give it a perfect 5 burgers out of 5. The next topic that I would like to cover for BDO is the crafting system. I give BDO's crafting system a meager middle ground 3 burgers out of 5. The crafting system in this game is a bit different, and most of it falls under the category of AFK crafting. For example, like I mentioned earlier with both cooking and alchemy, you buy a cooking or alchemy tool, you buy a residence here, let's see, where's mine? Hide line 4 is right there. You put all of your stuff into your residence, you purchase all the regions, or farm the regions, or gather the regions, or buy them from a vendor, right? You select your recipe, you let your character cook or craft potions for a period of time as you AFK or put BDO into the tray. You're not really actively crafting like you would in other MMOs. It's a little bit different in that sense. There's also workshop crafting, which is done through workers. So for example, I have a furniture workshop here that I use to produce. Hydelian handcrafted wardrobes, my storage is just currently full, so they're not making any at the moment. But in order to make those, see it needs like five maple plywood, 15 logs, three bronze ingots, and five blackstone powder. So like the blackstone powder I can just buy in the marketplace. The ingots I technically could, but what I'll do is I'll gather tin and copper and then I'll smelt them and then I'll smelt the results of that together and it makes a bronze ingot. Logs you can buy generally or I gather them a lot. I do a lot of log chopping so that involves my gathering. And maple plywood you also get maple from the gathering of the logs and then you process those maple pieces into maple planks and then you go to actually a different handcrafting workshop here. Uh, this one is called the woodwork bench and you can make maple plywood into makeable planks and then you combine all that to make this furniture and then you sell it on the marketplace so there is that element of crafting there the ui is not very intuitive unfortunately as mentioned earlier so i couldn't really give it a better score furthermore it rarely feels like you really craft things with your character other than the occasional you know like simple alchemy or chopping logs or something like that um let's take a look at my house here real quick this is another one of my homes and you can see we've got, oh, I don't have an alchemy tool in here. This is all decorative. But as you can see, we've got some basic stuff that you can craft if you consider like chopping logs AFK to be crafting, so to speak. So it is not really the traditional idea of crafting that I think of, which is why I gave it a middle ground three burgers out of five. The next topic that I'd like to cover is BDO's multiplayer. Now, if we take a look at the map here. As I showed you guys earlier, there are some group spots. This is one of the most popular. We call it trees, but it's actually called Miramook Ruins because you're fighting tree ant style enemies. And it is a two to three party recommendation and is designed for that. Unfortunately, I can only give BDO's multiplayer a middle ground three burgers out of five. You're not gonna get the same kind of group content that you do in other MMOs like WoW or New World or Swords of Legends, or any of those other ones that I've mentioned earlier. There aren't official roles of, you know, like tank or healer or DPS, although some classes are more tanky and some classes have heals and support and abilities and things like that that will help the other classes. But for the most part, you can see a lot of these places that we're looking at, there's not a whole lot of group places, there's a couple of them. And some of them aren't, you know, too, super end gamey because if you're super geared, you might not want to go to some of these lower level spots. Now on the Elvia servers, 
you do have like Castle Ruins, which is a 250 AP party of three recommended. So there is some end game group taunt content and multiplayer, but it's not like super fleshed out and it's not a major part of the game. It almost feels like an afterthought, which is why I give it a meager three burgers out of five. All right, so for the next topic, I'm actually going to ask my buddy Paid Piper here to help us out with this. We're going to talk next about PvP. So just to start us off, Paid, because I don't like wasting people's time, what would you give the overall PvP system of BDO out of five? So compared to other MMO uh, RPGs that I've played, being generous, I would give it a four. There's a lot of um, problems with it, but then again, those problems are going to be around for any game that you can't really fix. Yeah, that makes sense. So putting it on a scale with other MMOs, it's it's pretty solid. That's good to know. So I know that there's like a few types or varieties or ways to do PvP in this game. Would you mind covering those real quick? Uh, I might forget some, but starting from the top, I would say RBF, which there are three different types. Each, or each you play differently. For a quick rundown, Valencia is like a capture the points type of thing. Um, CR is a team deathmatch, and Garmoth I can't really talk about because haven't experienced it or played it. Yeah, you mentioned that you haven't seen more than like three full lobbies of the Garmoth one in a day, right? Yeah, it's it doesn't get as populated as uh, CR still, surprisingly, and uh, Valencia. And Valencia is the newest one? The newest one, yeah. It's okay. the one people are enjoying a lot compared to before. Oh, that's good to know. So what do you do in um, RBF or Red Battlefield? Uh, for Valencia, just capture points and um, little by little, points build up to certain threshold and then you win, or 20 minutes. For okay. CR, it's like a team deathmatch, or time. Garmas, as I said, I don't really know. So it's kind of like, it. I make my staple World of Warcraft a lot, so to compare it to something in that, it's kind of like Battlegrounds in WoW. I have not played WoW enough for that. <laughs> oh, okay, fair enough. But it's very similar in WoW. We had, you know, like, Capture the Flag Battlegrounds where it'd be, like, a team of 10 on 10. Or, like, Point Capture Battlegrounds where it'd be, like, 15 on 15 or something like that. Yeah. In for RBF, it's uh, max teams of uh, 30 versus uh, 30. Okay, yeah. So that sounds very familiar. Awesome. Um, What other, like, types of PvP are there other than the Battlefield? Open world PvP, which could be anything between a uh, random GVG that pops up out of nowhere. So one guild uh, is decked on another guild, which just means that uh, not really there's beef, but there is something going on between them. And then they just start fighting. Uh, the deck means that you can go, you can fight with them at all times, except on safe zones, of course. Um, GVGs that pop up out of nowhere or random people going red or archer servers that you can go red without losing anything 1v1s duel for spots cool stuff so there's like a lot of like open world stuff actually so to speak at least it's optional it's there yes and a lot of people will say that they don't like it and a lot of other people will try to shove it down your throat yeah that's kind of the nature of this game um i haven't had a lot of issues with people pvping me and getting ganked but then again, I'm not at the at the high end spots, and I know that it's a bigger issue once you get to the really high gear spots. Personally, I haven't had uh, any issues with it really, apart from some outliers every now and then. But um, in Arsha, it's a lot different since it's uh, essentially the open world PvP version of uh, any other server. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then there's also like what is it, Guild Wars or Guild versus Guild or something, or like Node Wars. Node Wars, yeah. There's a whole hierarchy, and it's just uh, democracy. I don't. It's it's just a lot. There's a whole last Discord server specifically made just for which guild is holding this today, or if there is actually gonna be a fight, or is someone decking on someone and not actually fighting. Yeah, I believe it. I actually played a lot of this game called Last Oasis, which was really popular for a while and then really quickly died off. But it was very similar. There's like some really big mega clans and there's a lot of like organization among the clans on like, oh, we're going to get all our guys and have this big fight here at this time kind of thing. But then there's yeah. also randomly people just ganking you out of nowhere, you know? So it's, yeah. it's similar uh, in that regard. Node Wars and stuff like that are generally done at a specific time. The people going back and forth as to who's holding this, who's holding that. Are we actually going to fight or are we just going to pretend to fight? 
or are we just gonna let people have fun but there's still gonna be some people destroying the fort it's it just depends so it's, it's relatively organized so to speak yes there's a lot of organizing to it but then there's also sometimes that some guilds decide to go rogue and just say nah we're just we're having fun today but that generally doesn't happen or happen at uh, higher tiers yeah that makes sense all right so that kind of covers most of the like the different types of pvp so to speak how does combat feel to you like compared to just other games with a similar style how does the combat in pvp feel does it feel smooth is it clunky i would say a lot of the problems between pvp in this game is in connection issues between players and stuff like that with uh um, okay yeah just lagging and like uh, desync issues yeah it's just a lot of it okay um but like how see you can combo me down really quickly right is that because of a gear differential uh or... yeah that was I, I also didn't mean to use a 100% that was, should not be toggled on. Gear plays a big part of it to a certain point. After a certain point, it just doesn't really matter. At that point, it just depends on your build. If you go in evasion or DR, or if you're fighting in a large group or 1v1. If you're DR, you'll mostly end up doing better at large groups because if you're going evasion, you're going to be squishier if they actually manage to hit you. And when there's 20 people dogpiling on you, you are going to get hit. So DR is generally the better part for that, but anything else, evasion is just better. However, you risk a very small portion of damage for it. Yeah. Okay. So it, it to me, it sounds like it's very situational. There's a lot of factors when it comes to like the feeling of the combat and like gear playing a role versus people playing a role yeah. and your chances of victory. Yeah. Can you, as a um, lower geared player in a one on one, do you stand a chance against the higher geared player, or are you just absolutely done for? Again, I I would say it depends on the class matchup. Cause, for example, as a sage, my dash, this little, my primary source of movement in any sort of a uh, fight is not uh iframe so let's say a guardian manages to do a claw reveal and they're 305 ap or so i'm getting chunked to at least 75 percent it's happened yeah. before so <laughs> no matter how much i move i i will still get almost one shot but at the same time i could just get behind them and yeah like that's like crazy you dropped me in literally one attack like i know i'm under geared compared to you but it's still like it what do you do in that situation as the lesser geared player? You just die? Yeah, it, it really is dependent on class and how much you play it. Because, for example, Kuno can go invisible, but at the same time, uh, go invisible real quick. I, I can still do this and it covers a yeah. pretty big area. Right, so, so if I just like use one of my attacks on you, let's see. See, like, that's one of my strongest attacks. It wasn't a back attack, but it hardly touched you. Is that because of your higher gear, your higher DP? Yeah. I'm not a evasion, so I didn't really dodge much. Okay, and so it's just straight damage reduction in that case. Pretty much. Okay, cool. So, getting back to the main thing here, how do you feel about, like, just the fluidity of the combat? Like, does it feel good overall, or are you saying it's all situational depending on, like, your class and, and who you're fighting and stuff? I feel like the combat itself feels good, but the fighting as a gear difference is can be really annoying because let's say you're a black class, like for example, warrior, guardian, you know, stuff like that. At that point, it could very well be a skill matchup because you could just stand there blocking all my hits, but at the same time, I could just dash behind you. In terms of that, everything feels really responsive. So like, if I'm trying to dash behind you, I will most likely dash behind you. The bigger problem is the desync, because if I dash behind you and I do this, which is a CC, if I, well, if I do it quicker, it actually comes out how I meant it to. I mean, you still knocked me down. Well, yeah, but I could just do it instantly, kind of. But there's also the issue with desync, because if I teleport behind you, there might be a chance that I just either don't knock you down because you resisted it or because the game still thinks I'm in front of you when that attack hit. Or because I'm actually further back five feet than what's showing on your screen. Because I've seen that. Like, I'll play yes. with my fiance and like I'll be standing somewhere on my screen that's completely different than her screen. 
Yes, that that can happen. It's it's less common than just the game being weird with its frontals and stuff like that. Because a frontal is supposed to be, you know, your front, 180 degrees. Right. But a lot of the time, it just happens that you're, let's say, right there, which is it's still within 180 degrees, but the game doesn't think of it as so, or it just yeah. registers you being at a separate location. Yeah, like and, slightly turned or whatever. Yeah, and that's the bigger problem with the desync, because no matter what I'm using, this this is protected. It's not an iframe or a frontal, but it's still protected. It's an SA. But you can still get CC'd through SA's, because, well, you shouldn't, but you can, because desync. Yeah, that makes sense. I see exactly what you're saying. So overall, like, the, the combat, the movement, it feels good, it feels fluid. But there's some clunkiness in the PvP, mostly because of like server issues, connection issues, and desync issues. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Okay. Apart cool. from that, I would honestly say all classes can realistically, if you both play the same class the same amount of time and have the same gear, you could still defend yourself no matter if the class is the strongest in the game right now or not. Right. Yeah. I mean, obviously, somebody, some classes are always going to have an advantage. That's just how it is in MMOs. Um, some classes are naturally stronger, some are naturally better against others, but it sounds They're... like it's relatively balanced, like a lot of classes have a good chance for the most part. Yeah, a lot of them, but there's still some outliers, um, some just feel really weak, some feel really strong. Uh, Suck Guardian, for example, is really good at 1v1s, or, well, honestly, at any type of PvP, but then you put them in PvE, and it's not bad, but it's not comparable to... Awakening, for example. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, well, that's good. I appreciate all your input on that. One last question I have for you is, how do you describe or how do you feel about PvP progression in this game? And I've talked about gear progression separately in this video, but specifically, like, as a PvP player, is it hard for you to get better gear in order to be have a better chance at PvP? So, I'm not a full PvP player, but I do know people that are, and I do pvp enough to realize that if you are a full pvp player you're gonna hate your life there are no rewards for doing pvp at most you can get three bill in one night from no doors and that's if you manage to win or you can get 10 or you can get like at most 30 mil an hour doing rbf if you get lucky and you win everything okay so and to put it on scale for people that don't know 30 mil an hour is not a lot you can grind a middle to your spot and make like 300 mil in an hour yeah it's 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 terrible <laughs> so it basically no like in order to progress through pvp you still need to do pve to get better gear in this game yes you could okay. for pvp you need to do something that actually makes you money whether it's life skilling or pve generally okay. it's pve because you're actually doing combat at the same time and you don't have the discrepancy between having two gear sets Money from PvP is just Gotcha. Okay, well that's good to know. Alright, um, I think that's a really good brief analysis of the PvP systems in this game. I really appreciate it. Uh, do you have any final thoughts or comments on the PvP system that you'd like to make? You should be able to make more money from PvP. I, I agree. Now that I know more about it, I think you definitely should. Alright, so overall, once again, we're gonna give the PvP system in Black Desert Online a solid 4 burgers out of 5. Now let's go ahead and move on to the next topic generous for a generous for <laughs> the next topic that i'd like to cover is bdo's community overall i actually give the community of bdo a solid four burgers out of five i have heard some negative things about the community and this is standard in most mmos especially in pvp and in the end game pve scenes in my personal experience though it's been pretty good i've also found a really awesome guild which makes a world of difference so once again shout out to solstice my super kill cool guild with all these really awesome people in it. They have made a world of difference when it comes to my experience with this game. I've had a few negative interactions with people, such as getting ganked with like no explanation, killed while auto pathing, but for the most part, it's been pretty positive. Even in some PvP scenarios, they've been pretty pleasant. Um, people will usually ask you like a duel for spot rather than just ganking you. That's a whole topic of its own that I'm not going to go into because some people don't like the duel for spot culture and it ends up kind of creating more conflict than it resolves. But for the most part, it does exist. Um, people will generally tell you like, oh, the spot is taken, 
One time I had a friend who didn't even look at their chat and didn't realize the spot was taken, and the person killed them that was already grinding there because they didn't they thought that their spot was being taken, right? So I messaged the person and the person was actually really nice about it and just said like, oh yeah, it was no problem. I just didn't want to lose out on my buffs. And it was super chill. And we just kind of moved on and went to a different spot and nobody came out of it um, with any issues pretty much. As I mentioned, people in my guild and in the chat groups have been very friendly. Now you might have a different experience, but in my personal experience, I've had a very positive interaction with most of the community, which is why I give BDO's community a solid four burgers out of five. Moving right along, the next topic that I would like to cover is BDO's competitiveness. Now, please keep in mind that the content that I play might not be the same content that other people play. There's a lot to do in this game though. So I'm going to be talking about the competitiveness from my point of view as a primarily life skiller. Overall, I give BDO's competitiveness four burgers out of five. Pretty solid score. The game has a built-in active leaderboard for life skills, as well as a few other categories, you know, such as wealth over here, right? Oh look, one of our guys is on the wealth leaderboard. We actually have one that's usually number one, but they're probably on a different server. That being said, it's based on who's currently online and on that server. So as you can see, there's a whole huge list of servers here right now. I'm currently on Calpheon 6. So if I were to go to a different server, we'd be seeing completely different names on this life skill leaderboard here right and you can see even though i've got my main character on she's not in any of the top five spots in anything because i'm a somewhat newer player compared to how long the game's been out but i do have like the number 20 spot in sailing so since i have put a good amount of time and effort into sailing i've been able to kind of gain that leaderboard now the leaderboard can be especially fun at the beginning of a season since everybody's starting from scratch so if you're somebody who's like me who has kind of started more recently this gives you an opportunity to start with a fresh slate with everybody else and kind of compete with them. So at the beginning of the seasons, you don't really get a huge benefit from this, but I mean, you're playing a game. The benefit is having fun and doing what you enjoy. So I enjoyed the opportunity to get on those leaderboards and top a bunch of them for the life skills early on. Of course, I didn't stick with it for too long, so people passed me by, but it was a lot of fun for what it was at the moment. Now, we're going to talk about next some of the pvp competitiveness and i do want to refer back to the stuff that my buddy said about this but just keep in mind that there are guild wars there's node wars end game grind spots can be very competitive during certain situations so for example one of the most popular spots here is to grind at orcs on an lvs server the orc camp it's a 200 ap recommended zone you'll end up running into a lot of people that will probably ask you for duel for spots or possibly try to fight you, a lot of the times the spots will be taken, and there's a whole etiquette thing in this game where if the spot's taken, you either leave the person or you go ask them to duel for it. Unless you're one of those guys that just wants to kill everybody and doesn't care, but that's a different story, right? So it is there. There is some competitiveness when it comes to the end game PvP, that's for sure. Overall, I really enjoy the implementation of the competitiveness in this game, which is why I give BDO's competitiveness a solid four burgers out of five. The next topic that I would like to cover is the average queue and load times in this game. I give BDO's queue and load times four burgers out of five. Pretty good. I've yet to experience any queue times in this game. In other MMOs, especially during launch, sometimes the servers will be full and you won't be able to get in. And you'll have to wait in the queue for me, you know, five minutes or five hours, depending on the server, depending on the time, depending on the event, etc., etc. Right? I haven't experienced that in this game at all. Load times, on the other hand, are actually quite minimal. The biggest issue for the load times is the alt accessibility in this game. So let's go ahead and switch to an alt right now. Uh, oh, I like her, Crimson Hyacinth. And let's kind of take into account how long it takes for us to swap from one character to another. The game really encourages creating and playing alts. And when you swap between characters, you're always gonna run to this load screen that we're seeing here. In fact, there's two load screens. That being said, it's usually pretty fast and you never see one if you're staying on one character, unless there's some sort of like a server blip or desync. Occasionally, you'll randomly get a load screen. It has happened to me, but it's not like a common issue. Sometimes the travel distance or the travel time is referred to as a load screen. And just in the time that I've been saying that, we've been able to swap from one of my characters to another. Oh man, she actually looks really good here with the cherry trees that they just added today because of the season change to spring. Because um, she's got the pink 
samurai aesthetic going on. It matches really well. But you can see how fast it was to swap to her, right? And let's go ahead and swap back to my other character to get another example here. Now, you'll notice in a lot of these topics that I was covering, I was running my horse, right? I was running from spot to spot. A lot of time you're going to be doing that. That's why sometimes people kind of refer to the load screens in this game as being the traveling time, right? All that being said, you can still kind of do management things while you're traveling. So let's get back on my horse here. And once again, you can see the load time was not too bad at all. Um, but keep in mind, of course, load times are always going to be dependent on your hardware, right? If you ha don't have the best hardware, it might take you a little bit longer for you to load in. If you've got a fancy brand new, you know, multiple thousand dollar computer, you're probably going to be loading pretty quickly. Now, as we're running here, I can be doing other things. I can be selling stuff on the marketplace. I can be collecting what I got. Like, oh, look, I, I gathered a bunch of deer hide. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put that up on the marketplace and sell it while I'm you know, doing all this other stuff. Of course, it's not selling right now because I already have orders up. But here, I'll sell all my water. And in the meantime, my horse has been running, right? And as you get a better horse and you get better gear, you can then get your horse to go faster. You can learn auto sprint. And you can learn these really cool abilities that make your horse go like insanely fast. I have like one of the best horses in the game. Um, I wouldn't call it the best, but it's definitely way up there. It's a dream horse is what they're called. It's a tier nine and it's trained fully. It's got all its skills and they're all fully trained. So if I'm doing this actively like this, I have to actually hold down a bunch of buttons to do this like sprint um, over and over thing. Look at how much faster I'm going though. So that reduces that travel time, which in a way, depending on how you look at it, is kind of like BDO's version of load times. Overall, I didn't think that this game handles load and queue times very well. It's kind of a minor issue that I rarely even think about, which is why I give it four burgers out of five. Moving right along, one of the final topics that I would like to talk about for this game is BDO's progression and grindiness. This game is almost quite literally a nonstop grind. For some people, that sounds disgusting, and it's an immediate turnoff. For others, though, it means a whole world of nonstop progression. I'm not a big PvE guy, but I was at like 253, 254 AP for a while, 251 AP for a while. Slowly, slowly, slowly progressed up to 252, 253, 254, 255. Now I recently bumped up because I got this thing from Tet to Pen, which is essentially like tier 4 to tier 5. It bumped me up from 255 to 257 which is a pretty nice change because there's hidden AP brackets and at 257 I get another nice boost. But as you can see, that took me a long time and I haven't even been playing the game that long. These guys that have been playing this game forever, like let's just go look here. Um, can you buy Fallen God? Yeah, Fallen God's armor. 282 billion. 282 billion to buy the best one. That is like months and months and months of grinding the top tier spots. So there is a large, large, large room for progression, which is why I give it five burgers out of five. I'm giving it a perfect score for that very reason. It's extremely grindy, but that's the point, right? For someone like me who loves continual progression over time, this scratches that progression grind itch very well. I really like it. It's not for everyone. It's a very long-term time investment, but you can also always progress even if you're not putting as much time into it as somebody else, which is why I give the progression and grindiness of BDO a perfect five burgers out of five. Overall, once again, I'm giving BDO a really solid four burgers out of five. I'm giving it that score because I've really been enjoying this game. It's really been scratching a certain MMO style progression itch that nothing has been able to do since World of Warcraft, to be honest. As such a wide variety of activities and forms of progression, it creates an immersive open world atmosphere that flows seamlessly. The player base is alive and healthy, which is really important for an MMO. They're constantly adding more content and updates. There's events literally every week after every maintenance of every patch that they do on a weekly basis. If you're an MMORPG fan, I would highly recommend this game to you. Thank you guys so much for watching and have a good night.